over time. So thanks everybody for joining. Happy Climate Week. We're really excited to, to have you all joining us here. We're really excited for this, this awesome panel. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction to Waterfront Alliance and myself. I'll introduce our panelists, and then we have about an hour here. So we will go through a series of questions um, around the topic that we're here to discuss today, which is climate-ready housing. And I'll talk about what that really means here in just a second. And then we will open it up for the last 10 or 15 minutes to audience Q&A. So um, you should be able to populate the Q&A um, function in Zoom with your questions, and we'll, we'll do our best to get through all of them. So again, thanks so much for joining. Uh, today's webinar. Um, this is a webinar part of Waterfront Alliance's Climate Week New York City series. For those who don't know, Waterfront Alliance is a nonprofit organization with a growing alliance of more than 1,100 partners focused on environmental and economic development and bringing real changes to coasts and shorelines and waterfronts around the New York and New Jersey Harbor region and beyond. And so for Climate Week, we're doing um, a series of, of webinars and in-person events that are tackling real issues that we're see seeing here in New York and across the nation. Um, a few of them have already happened and those recordings are on YouTube, but we also have a couple of really exciting ones coming down the rest of the week focused on redlining, um, community land trusts, and this year's hurricane forecast. So I'd encourage folks who are interested to check those out. I think we just got a link in the, in the chat, so feel free to check that out. Today's webinar is called Climate Ready Housing, Are We Prepared? And it's my honor to introduce our panelists today. I'll go through really quickly and introduce them. And then as we're going through, feel free um, panelists to say a little bit more about your work too. So first up, we have a real emerging leader in this field, Anushi Garg. Anushi is a senior analyst at the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and she works in the Climate Resilient Coasts and Watershed Program in the New York and New Jersey area. Thanks for joining us, Anushi. We're also very lucky to be joined by Max Clark. Max is the co-founder of a venture-backed insurtech company called Plover Parametrics. We next have, um, uh, we're really grateful to have the perspectives of Ilana Judah. Ilana is an associate principal and um, uh, is the associate principal and Ameri America's adaptation and resilience leader at Arup. And lastly, we have my friend Rod Scott. Um, who's maybe one of the best off-the-cuff statisticians that I know. And so you'll get a lot of facts here from Rod, I know. And he's a seasoned uh, expert in flood hazard mitigation and is the board chair of the Flood Mitigation Industry Association. So thank you all for joining us. That's a brief intro, so feel free to go into more depth as we go. And just to set the stage here before we go into our questions, we're not going to talk really specifically about climate impacts directly and like the projections for those. I think everybody is sort of aware at a, at a, at a general level of what those are. The specific impacts that we're going to talk about today, though, that are going to frame the discussion are around coastal flooding, which includes rising sea levels, tropical storms and hurricanes, and tidal flooding. Um, we're also going to look at inland and, and, and coastal flooding, particularly driven by extreme rainfall and stormwater, and then extreme heat, which is really across the board. It's affecting everybody, coastal, inland, and all, and all over the, the region and the country. So we're really going to focus on how prepared or unprepared our housing stock is for these climate impacts, both for renters and for homeowners. And then I also want to take a moment to just ground this conversation in the in the struggle that we're all dealing with in some way or another, which is the fact that this is a discussion about a housing crisis amid a climate crisis. And these are very real um, and very challenging problems that we're talking about. And these are social um, struggles that we're dealing with as a, as a real direct result of social and economic motives that have really historically put um, profits over people and have really led to a lot of inequality. And, and we're going to talk about some of that here. And so I think there's always often kind of this sentiment that climate and environmental issues are not really the top priority among um, voters or, or or working class people of the country. And we, we hear that time and time again. I'm saying that right now because it's around the election time and there's not a lot of coverage around it. Um, you know, we always see issues around housing and health care, the economy and all of those things. And these are the kind of front burner issues and climate okay, that's a little farther away. There's more immediate pressures and stressors that we're all dealing with. But I actually think that um, it's embedded in all of that. And so, you know, that's what I hope the conversation will get at today, right? What good is affordable housing if if it's underwater or if there's uh, if the building is regularly losing power? And is that really then truly affordable? Um, and we could talk about that for healthcare and the economy and so much more. And so I hope that that kind of helps us center this this conversation. So to start, I'd like to go around and ask each of the panelists um, in your line of work, 
what are the most pressing climate resilience challenges faced by communities in high flood risk areas or experiencing chronic heat stress? And then given the breadth of your experience um, on this panel, could you each share an example of how climate change is a threat multiplier for housing issues in for communities that might already be experiencing, you know, other other social issues. And so maybe we can go around in the order that we started. Um, so Anushi, if you if you want to kick us off. Sure. And thanks everyone for uh, joining and it's great to be here. I hope you all can hear me okay. Okay, great. So I think uh, when we talk about climate resilience and you know speaking about climate threat as a multiplier, I think I think of I think of Talk, thinking of this like a story. Uh, if you think of New York City, for example, uh, historically, um, you know, unlike other parts of the country, like the city developed over areas which used to be wet and streams, um, and so we we took away the ability for the city to uh, for the for 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 the city's natural resilience benefits that would mitigate climate multipliers like climate threats like heat and flooding, um, and so we have an unequal landscape of risk. Um, to work with at this point, and so given the history of environmental uh, of environmental history of the place, and also redlining all the, all the other issues that that come with that, I think um, I think we really really need to think about uh, what we are doing in terms of how much we are building, and more importantly where we are building, and think about these things in a granular way, uh, and think about these things with communities who are seeing these issues manifest every day. Um, at EDF, to speak about our work a little bit more, we are working with the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development and the Regional Plan Association to address some of this. Um, and these partners are helping us think about affordability as a key component of this problem of housing and climate. And then the Regional Plan Association is helping us figure out how we can think about the question of housing supply, which, of course, there's existing housing, but we're constantly talking about building new housing. And so how do we create that in this city, which is already so built up over old wetlands and streams? So that's part of that's part of my answer, I think. And in that context, we we think about when we think about affordable housing, there's a big affordable housing type in New York City, which is co-ops. And uh, we completed a research recently with Cornell University and found that co-op housing in New York City, hundreds of which are uh, vulnerable to floods, are ineligible for FEMA assistance um, for their public spaces, for their common shared space especially. So owners of the units in these buildings have to figure out a way to self-fund. Uh, so these are kind of challenges that one, one needs to be thinking about here. And then there's a piece of insurance, which I'm sure Max will talk about. Uh, so not to go for too long, but I think that that's the other thing we need to think about is how do we, how do we figure out a way to make insurance of, uh, act uh, affordable for people and make sure that they can protect what they have. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Anushi. And actually tease it up really well. Max, we'll go to you next and then Ilana. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, that was a, a nice layup, Anushi, to talk about the insurance component, um, which I kind of view as like a product of three overlapping issues. One of them is definitely climate, right? The frequency and the severity of loss causing events is continuing to increase. Um, but it's definitely not the only part. Like another, I think equally important part is that people continue to build in places where you know, like we probably shouldn't be building and probably shouldn't be rehabilitating. And so you're kind of, you know, continuing to build in, in places. Oftentimes, unfortunately, those also to be happen to be places where there are historically underserved and vulnerable populations um, that are, you know, continuing uh, to, to exist in, in areas that are higher, that are much higher risk. And then finally, there's like, what I will call like regulatory challenges, um, which make it harder for the insurance industry writ large to offer new products and also in some cases like to correctly price risk. So I think like those things together, like the VIN and those three things is like why I think it is increasingly the case that, you know, particularly for housing, although not only for housing, um, insurance has gotten you know, so expensive, particularly in places that are that are coastal and or flood exposed. Um, of those all, I think like, it's hard to kind of pick one that is the most important, but I think the thing that is perhaps most actionable um, is the regulatory piece. Um, and that is challenging because on the one hand, like the, the populations that need the strongest consumer protections are vulnerable populations, but also, you know, I think historically those protections have made it harder for the market, the insurance market to expand and offer products at prices that they can afford to, to do it at. Um, so lots of interesting kind of like angles to, to that question. But yeah, I think like the, the solution to more affordably priced insurance probably exists somewhere in the middle of that of that 
uh, of that Venn diagram. Thanks, Max. Alana, and then Ron. Yeah, I'd like to raise the, um, to me, the most pressing issue here is a question of the vulnerability, um, not only of the occupants or the those who are needing the housing. So Max mentioned the most vulnerable population. So there's there's kind of a snowball effect of you've got these vulnerable populations. They have a hard time finding housing because of their economic situation or the redlining or what have you. Um, so they are end up in potentially challenging locations when it comes to climate exposure. And then furthermore, the buildings themselves, the housing that they're occupying can be physically more vulnerable because, you know, whether it's existing buildings that have been, you know, that are older, that haven't been, uh, uh, you know, don't have adequate funding for proper updating or retrofits or, you know, operational um, operations and maintenance. So it's sort of a snowball effect of all of those vulnerabilities coming together. And then finally, I think the vulnerability gets further exacerbated when you start to think about potential funding options and the cost benefit analysis, because the property values in these areas are much lower and the, you know, the hazard mitigation measures technically cost the same, right? Flood protection is flood protection. Obviously it varies a little bit, but when you're doing the cost benefit analysis, that, that return on investment is different because the property values are lower. Um, and so it, it's really this snowball effect that really is rooted in vulnerability that I think is really important to address. Thanks, Alana. And then Rod, last last thought on this question. You're still on mute, Rod. Yes, I'll just leave it off. My background problems with my dog. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so this country is already short of housing, millions of units short of housing. Uh, for the last 20, 30 years, we have really focused a lot of the housing folks, I call them housing nonprofits and whatever, have really focused on generating and building new housing. Only now are we starting to look backwards and, and HUD is doing a, a project right now that our industry is involved with, um, is all of a sudden we're looking, well, I, I put into the chat, the Congressional Budget Office uh, report that came out in May, which was just sobering and really uh, scary. Um, 10.5 million residential units are going to need retrofitting uh, worth an asset value of three north of $3.5 trillion. And if you remember the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy was in the castle with the flying monkeys and they had the hourglass. Well, we're all we're in the bottom section of the hourglass, and the divot is starting to show. Uh, we're running out of time. We're increasing the insurance rates on all of the old buildings because they have extreme high flood risk. Buildings can be adapted. Adapting buildings to climate change is not inexpensive, and it's not easy. We don't adapt as many of those 10 million units as we can. We're going to have an even worse housing problem because we are going we are headed for a devaluation in these assets across the board at some point banks and insurance are are getting more and more aware of this and more and more leery of long term commitments to these structures and we need to retrofit them and we can it's going to create a it's going to have to be a space program type national effort actually it's got to be a global effort uh, create jobs in the climate adaptation industry, adapt our buildings as many as we can. You know, I've got four daughters and nine grandchildren, and I don't want to hand it off right now to the way it is because it's really weak. And we keep getting slammed. If we can just stop getting the building slammed and the people devastated with losing all of their belongings, uh, we will have some breathing room to then figure out the next adaptation, but we've got to get, we've got to stop the bleeding of these buildings getting flooded again and again and again. And our industry has uh, said this year from here forward, we are focused on the uh, vulnerable, disadvantaged, income challenged communities first. The wealthy can take care of themselves. They'll finance their own retrofits that, you know, that they, they want to keep their asset values. So, uh, it's it's going to take a, a whole of 
the population to do this, and we're going to have to finance it. There'll never be enough government grants to do this. Uh, you know, three trillion, three and a half trillion in asset value. It's probably at least a trillion to retrofit all those buildings, or we live in tents under bridges. Yeah. I don't want to do that. So anyhow, thanks. Yeah, no, that's great. And really appreciate that kind of everybody kind of setting the stage on some of the challenges in your respective industries. And so we're going to actually start diving a little deeper into all of this and in, in just a second. And so, you know, I, I again, g just to give the audience kind of the sense of these are kind of the, the widespread issues that we're dealing with when we talk about climate ready housing, right? You have on one and one thing that we didn't talk about here that we will in a second is, you know, on one side of the spectrum, you have efforts around funding relocation or, you know, managed retreat from these kind of high risk areas. On the other side of the spectrum, you have what Rod is, is, is sort of alluding to here around retrofitting and fortifying some of the structures. And then there's a lot in between that, you know, insurance obviously plays a role in in both and all of these kind of scenarios. And so, um, you know, I guess I want to stick with these kind of these kind of topics here, and maybe we can go again around. And I'll I'll start Alana with you if you might want to if you might tell us a little bit about what you think the role is or what has been the role of retrofitting our existing housing stock and how is that happening now? How do retrofits kind of help mitigate some of these issues that we've that we've talked about? And then you know, Rod, I'll, I'll go to you to sort of pick up on a next step there. Yeah, as as Rod has been, uh, you know, very um, eloquently explained, retrofits have not been the priority, right? Um, they're hard. Um, there have been certainly reactive to events, certainly after Sandy, you know, people were elevating their homes or Katrina and so forth, but it hasn't been sort of the, you know, the, the, the calculus, especially for affordable housing is incredibly challenging when you're dealing with retrofits. They're expensive, they're messy, you have to relocate people temporarily. Um, so I think we're at a point where we have a tremendous amount of funding. Um, it's also kind of a nexus. I call it sort of the triple word score. If anybody plays Scrabble, is you know, these buildings are getting old. They need other types of retrofits. They need energy retrofits. They need just general property condition. They're underfunded properties. They need roof replacements. And we have to find ways to identify synergies. You know, it's like not just about a resilience retrofit. It's about the durability of a building, which ties to resilience. It's about the health of the you know, and safety of the occupant. It's about the energy efficiency. And we have to find ways to align. Um, so we're also working with HUD on and enterprise community partners on developing resilience property condition assessment tool um, that can fund, you know, that uh, sort of funnels into the GRRP funding so that the owners can actually get funding. But I think the key here is also um, how do we align retrofits uh, across the various needs of our property, not just for resilience. And then also, I think the other piece of this is on the regulatory side. You know, how can how, how can we accommodate zoning changes, right? If, if you've got maximum heights or setbacks or what have you, or other zoning requirements or regulatory requirements that are, in, you know, conflicting with what you can do. How do we, and I think New York City has done some good work on that, post Sandy and other locations as well, like Boston, but how do we really align uh, to facilitate retrofits and kind of, um, uh, you know, remove any of these kind of conflict, conflicting barriers, whether it's within different codes um, or also within um, zoning restrictions? Thanks, Alana. And I'll put a link here in a second. The GRRP that you're referring to, of course, is a green resilient retrofit program that's out of the U.S. De um, Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, that we're referring to here. So thank you. And, and you know, Rod, I guess I, I'll just ask you to sort of pick up on that thread. Um, and if you could maybe talk a little bit about how you your experience working on um, retrofitting homes. I know you have experience actually doing that, you know, in down in, in the Gulf region in Louisiana and and maybe in Florida. And so could you maybe share some successful examples of the resiliency retrofits around the country and maybe just very quickly also talk about like what exactly, you know, elevation people, I think, can kind of understand that. But what are some other examples of retrofits beyond elevating the home? Right. Like that people can, can consider. And I know there's a question in the chat kind of around that, too. Oh, interesting. I hadn't checked the chat. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I've done about 1,500 retrofits uh, in the last 20 years since Katrina. Um, uh, I'm done. I'm 67. I'm kind of handing it off to the younger younger teams now, and uh, I'll do more guiding and leading, um, which we have to have. So 
the the exciting part is that like here in Louisiana, we've done 36,000 up in the air since Katrina. We, we've perfected slab elevation where we have these structural slabs that the houses sit on. We can lift the whole slab um, at 14, 15 feet in the air, but you've got to then retrofit the roof because the roof will fly off at a higher wind zone, which we found out in Ida. Um, so the Corps of Engineers is now getting into this business uh, in a big, huge way. They've got over a dozen of these non-structural flood risk reduction projects identified, uh, 14,000 buildings in Nassau County, New York, uh, 18,000 in the southern portion of New Jersey, uh, where we're not going to build levees anymore. They take 30 years. We don't have 30 years. We got to get as many of these assets preserved as we can uh, so that we can continue the revenue streams from these assets and the housing that they provide. Uh, the interesting thing here in Louisiana with the first pilot project in the southwest of Louisiana, where we're actually deploying our new workforce development program to build that workforce locally for that effort uh, is all low-income housing, income challenge housing. It goes first. Um, the roof retrofit that we're doing here in Louisiana now to get the fortified roofs um, is all going to be income challenged and workforce uh, um, workforce housing. Uh, we'll get the retrofits. So I think that we have to prioritize that. We have a history in this country of, of um, going with the higher value properties that have a higher assessed value. Remember the cost benefit is past damages, current value, future damages. We should really be looking at the replacement cost of those buildings. A square foot replacement cost is enormous these days where we can go in and retrofit for a third of the cost of building new and not have damages anymore. And we should do the energy at the same time we're doing the natural hazard retrofits, all about it. So create jobs, create jobs adapting to the changing climate. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. And we're going to talk about that workforce piece in a, in the next kind of round of questions. So I, I appreciate you kind of planting the seed there. And yeah, just going back to Ilana's point about kind of the, the, the resiliency and energy and all these things together, I think that's actually a big push and why we're having this conversation is because Actually, there's a, at least in New York City, people might be familiar with Local Law 97. There's a lot of efforts happening to, you know, decarbonize and modernize buildings, which are contributing to most of the city's emissions. And so that's a great that's a great step in the right direction. But, you know, I think it's important that we're also thinking about resiliency when you're going into those buildings already and doing upgrades. It's really a missed opportunity if you're not taking advantage of also considering, you know, adaptation and resiliency retrofits into those into those structures as well. So I, I kind of appreciate that that note that you both mentioned there. And I guess I'll go quick, Anushi, to you. Um, also, on the other side of the spectrum is this idea of, you know, relocation and, and managed retreat. And I, I guess I'm wondering if you might be able to share a little bit about how that approach kind of fits into this climate ready housing portfolio and, and how it can mitigate some of the things that we've discussed here. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's a lot of good work happening on this front. Uh, the biggest one that comes to mind is the, the New Jersey DP's Blue Acres program, uh, the buyout program, and huge shout out to them for managing that one because it's, it's a very difficult and complicated conversation, right? Um, because in a way, when we think about risk um, and trying to figure out a way to make people resilient, moving out of harm's way sometimes is the only option for some communities. Um, and while while that's easy easy to to say it's it's very hard to do because at the end of the day people don't want to move um and it's a very difficult conversation and very difficult thing to do um even practically and then it's also about asking people to relocate usually is away from the waterfront and so it's taking away from taking them away from the place that they're used to living in um so i think that acknowledging that in any conversation about relocation or retreat is really important uh, so I just wanted to say that um, the other piece of relocation that that we think about a lot is like, well, where are people relocating? Um, where will they go? Uh, in the New York metro region, about 1 million people live in the floodplain. We can't just relocate them. Where will they go? Um, and so this is, I think, the main question uh, to think about whether that's, you know, in a community scale, whether it's within a neighborhood, whether that's in a city like New York City, or whether that's a metro region or a larger region even. Um, I'll I'll keep this answer short, but I think that I think I I'm gonna leave us with questions here. Uh, but like important ideas and values to think about when you think about relocation is 
just the idea of making people move and the idea of where will people move um, in areas which are already urbanizing so fast. Yeah, that's really helpful. And again, I mean, I think it's it's really you're you're right that it's really complex and challenging thinking about moving and but I think ultimately a managed kind of I think that's why they manage you managing that process and having a plan and a roadmap for it, it could actually alleviate some of those problems. Whereas, you know, in many cases, people are relocating. This is already happening. It's people are relocating and leaving all across the country. I mean, Rod down in Louisiana, for sure, people are relocating. I, I grew up in Texas and after Katrina so many people came into Houston and Dallas and and relocated and that's happening in a very unmanaged way right now and so I think having a program to get to some of the uh, things that Anushi's talking about in terms of receiving communities or or creating places for people to go is really really important and we're going to get to that here in just a second too because uh, there's a lot more to say there but Max I wanted to make sure you had an opportunity here to maybe chime in and wonder what your thoughts are and and maybe if you could speak a little bit to how insurance can help incentivize some of these kind of topics that we're talking about here in terms of retrofits and relocation. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess Rod would be interested for your perspective on this too, because I feel like in some ways uh, rising prices and like non-renewal or cancellation of insurance is the market telling you that you need to relocate um, in a not very nice way. Um, I'll bet they're, Rod, your clients aren't excited to do something severe like a slab lift just because the insurance they can get is so cheap and so available. Um, but yeah, um, I guess so. A, a version of an answer to that, right, is that like insurance companies, they can incentivize buyers to harden their homes and businesses. Um, the hard part is just that many of those choices are very, very expensive and oftentimes require, uh, you know, regulatory and or other kinds of community sign off uh, for something like changing the character of a neighborhood. Um, I think the good part of that is that oftentimes those retrofits can like change the cost of the underlying insurance. Um, and so I, by way of example, um, we helped place a policy that gave $5 million of flood protection for a business in New York City that was very concerned with flood risk. Um, after Sandy, that business had taken several remediating measures to basically decrease the likelihood of flood in the future. Um, and so they were interested in a, an insurance product that would basically only pay out in like a Sandy-like event, um, which is a very severe event, effectively. Um, and so we were able to structure a product for them that was tied to the flood depth as reported by the government-run tidal gauges spread out around the city. And basically, if those tidal gauges registered a flood in excess of a very severe event, they would get the benefit of the insurance policy. That product was a lot cheaper, ultimately, because the kind of event was lower probability. It was much higher severity, um, but it required them to basically have gone and make those like retrofitting decisions um, in advance. Um, so these things can work uh, kind of in tandem, um, but definitely do require significant upfront investment, um, which is you know a question that you know the av av availability of financing um, is very important kind of to to answer and characterize. Yeah. That's really helpful. And I see Rod, you're off mute, but the next question is for you. So I'll, uh, if you have a response, there, I'll, I'll let you get to it. And let's stick actually here to this, to this, these kind of, comp this, this uh, relocation and retreat here for just a second, sorry, relocation and retrofits here for just a second. And then I'll, uh, for this round of questions, then Max, I'll come back to you and kind of grill you a little bit about what's going on in the insurance industry and some of the things that need to change. So um, like digging a little deeper here, uh, I'll, I'll Rod go back to you first, and I wonder if you could talk about some of the biggest barriers that uh, to implementing resiliency retrofits at scale. And I think really that's the key part of this question is doing it at scale. You know, we're talking about the millions of properties that you're saying that are at risk of flooding, and maybe you could give us just kind of the top two challenges that you're seeing in terms of really scaling that program. And I think the, the workforce seed that you planted might be might be one of those here. Yeah, uh, certainly workforce. We've we've got an industry that is, I mean, our our nation, the U.S., has relocated structures since its founding. In the old days, we just relocated the structure and built a new structure. Now we tear them down and put them in the landfill, which is not sustainable at all. And we're talking millions of buildings uh, that will need ultimately to be relocated. Um, so we we have to build the industry that we already have that we know how to do it into a, a large industry. When President Kennedy said, we're going to the moon in 10 years, and we said, sure, how are we doing that? And we built a 500,000 person workforce in Houston Space Center and Michoud Assembly Plant here in Louisiana, and we went to the moon. Uh, climate change, uh, look, the dinosaurs didn't adapt. We either adapt or we lose, and we can't live outside with the alligators, okay? And and down here, they say, oh, you got to relocate in Louisiana. 
where do you think your oil and gas comes from? Until we're ready to get off of oil and gas and able to, you've got to staff rigs, you've got to staff processing plants. And there's some think tanks going on that if we can't live down here, you're looking at $30, $40 a gallon gas, which will crush the economies because they're all based, it's all an oil based economy. So we are transitioning. I drive a 60 mile per gallon Prius trying to show my kids how to how to do this um, and decarbon our house and all these things. But we have to invest in adaptation right now in order to prevent us from doing uh, a really serious economic uh, crunch that's coming. And then we can have some breathing room. So workforce and then the financing. How there isn't enough government money to finance $3 trillion or a trillion dollars worth of real estate adaptation. Uh, the banks have already signaled that they are willing to finance this. Uh, I attended a closed meeting at the Treasury building back in 2018. Uh, no minutes, no reporting out. Uh, they Nobody wants to scare the real estate market. You scare the real estate market, all sorts of hell breaks loose. Uh, sorry about that. But it's it's really serious. And real estate's a, a pretty, pretty waffly kind of, uh, it's not a regular marketplace. And so... Um, the 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 beginning of that finance program is now in place the storm act which came about in 2018 right after the election uh, uh right before january 6th and in that transition period and it's it's in place it does not have the pipeline for the banks and the money that they committed that day in the treasury building if there was a, a loan program so the idea is really if we can finance it off mortgage on the property taxes Per property, 20-year financing, forgivable for the low-income, uh, income-challenged families, of, if they're lucky enough to have housing and building their own wealth through the ownership of, of the house, the American dream, then, then we should forgive those uh, folks uh, their financing loans. Uh, so it's in place and it's starting to move. We're the first country in the world to create a resilient revolving loan program for all the natural hazards the four big ones earthquake wind fire and flood i see that as the way that we're going to do that along with the corps of engineers doing mass numbers of projects yeah thanks for that rod and ilana i wonder if there's anything here maybe potentially you want to add in terms of challenges that you're seeing with with scaling these kind of retrofit solutions um across the board yeah i mean i think retrofits like again i'm coming from a design perspective so i think we have to we have to come up with a model that can be de-risked um so you know there's a huge number as rod said of buildings to be retrofit money is obviously money is a challenge as it always is but i think there's also a typological like there's an approach where we need to you've got multiple types of hazards and perils different parts of the country different types of construction different building types, you know, housing in New York is very different than than housing in, you know, rural Alabama, you know, completely different conditions, completely different perils. If you don't do it right, and you kind of apply the same tool to everything, you're going to get all kinds of, you know, problems down the line, whether it's mold or this or that, right? So you have to sort of structure a program where you can address the different perils, acknowledge the different typologies, um, you know, I'm a big fan of pilots where you, you sort of invest in, you know, a certain selection of properties, you de-risk the process, you partner designers with contractors who have local knowledge, um, you test solutions, right? You test them and you figure out what works and then you scale. And I'd be really curious to hear Rob's, Rob's perspective. And you invest a little bit more in those pilots, right? Because you can't spend a ton of money on every single property, but you invest in those pilots, you do your lessons learned, you do an appropriate sampling and sample size and representative sample, and then you you figure out how to scale that. And then, and as part of that, you're using that opportunity to train workforce in those pilots. But I'd love to hear more from Rod and others about um, what their thoughts are. Yeah, let's go, Rod. I mean, I don't know if you have anything, you know, in response to that or anybody else. I but want everybody free. to Google Google Street View, Mandeville, Louisiana. This is my community. It's 86% retrofitted now. Uh, after nine feet of water, we come back in about a week and a half, five feet a week or so ago with Francine, 
no sheetrock, no, no belongings out at the curb, just green debris, clean up. Everybody has a generator uh, on, on their property and, and auxiliary generator. And, and we're not leaving the waterfront until that toilet quits working. Uh, highest value, most taxes for the schools all come from that waterfront property. We're just not going to flood anymore. And so uh, not have flooded buildings. We're going to flood. We're going to flood more frequently <laughs> everywhere. So the secret is getting the buildings so they don't get damaged until we can figure out whatever next is. And I'm pretty much at the end of my run. So it's going to be uh, uh, my daughters and, and their generation. To, and you, as I've told you, you're, you're next. You got to figure it out next. So, um, uh, you know, the, the idea is that my community is the laboratory of design because the very first ones we we put up in the air were ended up two feet above where FEMA said we needed to be in the final maps. We just, people weren't going to wait. And my wife was the planning director and she she said, you're 50% damaged and no, no lifting, no permitting. And they all went up. They all cashed in stocks and bonds and, and went up. And, and we developed a local workforce for that, a local company that's still lifting homes here. And, uh, but the design factor, we, we actually, the National Park Service has come out with a flood adaptation guidelines for older and historic buildings. Uh, for both elevation and dry flood proofing. And they utilized a lot of the stuff that we've learned now. We have architects, an architect review panel in town that reviews all designs for elevating. And you have to have bricks around the concrete block piers. You have to have a, a skirt board. You have to have a uh, lattice underneath to, so we don't see all your stuff. But the locals found out that lattice was very expensive, so they developed a hinging routine, so indigenous local knowledge, and now they just lift their lattice up, and the storm comes and puts water underneath and green debris, and we clean it up, and we go back to work. So um, the pilots are already done. The problem is, and the opportunity here, as I've told HUD, is the first mass elevation program in the world was after Katrina, called the Road Home, and that's what got us. 30 some thousand up in the air. And then we've just kept adding to that every year it is we never did a post action report on that. We never did a study. We never looked at the issues. And now we're 20 years later. It's like, are you kidding me? Why didn't we look at that? And then somewhere along the line in 2016, um, certain influences in recovery that get a lot of money from managing recoveries and then some states got spooked about elevating and they haven't elevated since and and the insurance isn't going down and so we're just headed for this train wreck of values but we should have been elevating the whole time and learning from what we've done the state doesn't even have a database of the 36,000 up in the air why don't we have a database of that <laughs> so i love what alana was saying we this is adaptation it's only beginning we need to get designing going and we don't have designs for earthquake retrofit we don't have design for wind retrofit and we don't have design for fire retrofit so we should have design guidelines for that so yeah a lot here but thank you both for for sharing that and and good to hear a little bit of case studies and i know there was a question there in the chat too about the location and, I, and it's it's mandeville louisiana is, is that right rod yeah if you could just put that in the chat for everybody too, so they could look it up, that'd be great. And then just quickly on this topic, because I, I do want to go go to Max um, here uh, to talk about insurance. On the other side, of course, you know we're we're talking about retrofits here, but on the other side is the relocation and some of the you know I wanted to pose that same kind of question about re what 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 are some of the barriers in terms of implementation implementation for retrofit or uh, for a relocation and. I think I can start off, and there's a, a lot actually, but and we won't have time to go into them, but. You know, this is something that Waterfront Alliance has definitely been putting a lot of thought into. And and one thing for starters, it's really uh, it gets to the root of, I think, a big issue that exists for retrofits and everything, which is that we we tend to have a very reactive, always a reactive approach to all of these kind of solutions. I mean, this doesn't true for just relocation. It's true probably for retrofits, too, where that. Uh, you know, buyouts and relocation doesn't really start happening on scale until after a disaster. So that means your home has to essentially be like in a state of total disrepair for a federal buyout to happen. There has to be a disaster declaration called. This is for federal, you know, buyouts. There's some state programs that can be a little bit flexible. And she talked about the Blue Acres program in New Jersey. We know New York State and New York City are also looking at 
um, you know, in, uh, creating a buyout program that can be flexible because of that challenge, because you, you create this bottleneck where you have people who are looking at potentially relocation or are open to relocation or moving out of this high risk area. But you have to wait until the hurricane or the storm comes and then you're and then you're waiting, you know, a long period of time. And that's another challenge is the, is the timeline, right, that it can take, you know, two to five years for a federal buyout to go through. And, and again, who can afford to wait that long? It's it's not many people. You know, you end up taking typically the insurance money payout and if you have insurance and you rebuild. And hopefully you're rebuilding and retrofitting. But again, you rebuild and you kind of you're you're there and we have this cycle. And so that's that's kind of one challenge that that I see. And then another is around, you know, I think political will and is is can be a challenge and and financing where these programs can be pretty expensive. Um, and they do require a great deal of support, not just in terms of financing, but support in terms of social services. I mean, you're asking people to up and leave, you know, and, and Anushi alluded to this before, like, where are you, where are people going to go? In many cases, you're looking at communities that may have been there for generations and you're asking people to just pick up and leave. And so there has to be some sort of services and support for those people to understand where they can go, job opportunity, you know, that this is a really important part and that can't happen without funding. And, and I think that goes back a little bit to political will. And then one thing that I really want to mention that we don't have enough time to talk about, but wanted to at least, you know, put it out there is that a home in many cases is your greatest asset. It's your, it's your, you know, Rod said it before, it's people who have generational wealth, build wealth through their homes. And especially for lower income folks, you know, it's your step towards creating wealth for yourself and your family and future generations. And and low income households are at greater risk of losing home equity and, um, you know, price deflation from higher flood risk. And so what, you know, that puts you in a very tough situation. And so how do you ensure that people who are relocating, people who are moving are able to do it with economic and social mobility? And, and you know, one thing to consider, too, that's really complicated is if you're moving, does your new mortgage have the same rate that you paid when you first signed the mortgage or are you now moving into a property with a higher mortgage rate you know and that's enough there's all these kind of challenges that i think exist here and that goes back to this issue of creating a structured program that addresses them so that these challenges are not falling onto people in a post disaster scenario where you're you're dealing with so many other stressors and so I, I think i have to leave it at that because i do want to make sure we have time to go to max before we jump into the q a um so, you know, I'll, I'll come back to it and see if anybody has anything to add to that. But moving into insurance, Max, I'm wondering if you could talk about kind of the, the financing of these solutions and the challenge that's, that exists there. You know, we talked a little bit about how insurance payouts can be a tool often in a post-disaster scenarios, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about just generally the challenges with insurance in the country. You know, people in the audience are probably seeing insurance providers dropping out of places. And, you know, could you maybe speak a little bit to what's happening there, what shifts are starting to happen in the industry? Yeah, for sure. Um, so kind of you, I think, nailed the main, the main piece, right, which is costs are going up um, in very extreme examples. We're seeing carriers, insurance companies deciding to exit markets entirely. Um, that's usually because the regulators in those states have made it challenging, uh, if not impossible, for those insurance companies to increase prices to a level that they feel like they can at least make money off of by staying in the market. Um, so there's nuance there. Um, the regulator is obviously a political position in many or all of these states. Sometimes it's even elected. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting perverse incentives as relate to the insurance companies and the regulator and the other kind of political apparatus that exists as well. Um, but yeah, you know, there are products out there that can be, I think, used to fill in those gaps and allow people to buy coverage, even in places where the traditional market has kind of like failed to innovate. Um, we were talked about flood a lot. Um, those same style of products exist for fire. They exist for wind. Um, another example kind of from the more commercial side um, came from a deal that we worked on earlier this year for a solar renewables project. Um, so they were required by their lenders to buy wind coverage, but that coverage was very expensive because they were in an area that was very exposed. And so ultimately, what we helped them do is um, use the warranty under their panels, uh, which was good up to around 100, 120 miles an hour, um, to provide quote unquote coverage for events that fell up to that level and then structure an insurance product that started to pay in basically when the wind was higher than the panels were warrantied for. 
So i.e. you have warranty coverage up to X and then above X, you start to actually capture those benefits of insurance. The benefit of that approach is that because high wind events are less frequent, they are cheaper to insure. And so we can imagine you know, using that same kind of structure for a residential context, right? If you are able to install a roof that is warrantied up to whatever it is, um, and then structure an insurance product that comes in above that, you start to be able to see how you can capture some of the longer term benefits by cheapening the kind of insurance and other kind of like financial products that you'll have to purchase. Um, I do think you will start to see similar things happen in residential spaces. Um, I do think that it helps to think about what I sometimes call like natural aggregators. So like a municipality is just an example of a natural aggregator, right? Like it's one buyer, a town that impacts a lot of different people. Um, and I think, you know, there are good examples, including some in the places like California, where communities have kind of banded together to purchase the same kinds of coverages using grants from the state or elsewhere, or just higher taxes, basically, to, to pay the premiums. Um, there is, again, as before, like a lot of like regulatory nuance. Um, so obviously, public companies, um, you kind of spoke to this a little bit. Um, in order to be able to get um, FEMA disaster relief, right, you have to comply with the Stafford Act. Um, so you have to have some insurance because the government doesn't want to incentivize people not to have insurance by promising to pay when there's a disaster. But you can't have too much insurance because if you do, then you won't be able to double claim, so to speak. Um, so I think like being mindful of, of that dynamic um, can help communities basically get that high severity style of coverage. It's almost like a stop loss coverage um, for the community itself. Um, and I think you'll start to see more of that for wind, for fire, and for flood. Um, so I don't know if that was exactly re responsive to your, to your no, question, that's but great. some thoughts. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. And I appreciate you sharing some of the outside of just flood risk too, and how there's some like, you know, learnings from those other, those other kinds of protections and, and coverages. So that's really helpful. And um, you know, we're we're coming around to time here in the next 12 minutes or so. So before we go into the audience Q and A, I just want to leave the floor open for anybody who maybe didn't, who has something on the any any of the panelists who have anything to add or anything to say about any of the questions that we've talked about, or maybe something that we missed that you just want to say really quickly here before we move into the audience Q and A. So I know I, I kind of went through some of this stuff really quickly. So Ilana, go ahead. Let's start with you. Yeah, I think resilience need uh, resilience in housing really needs to be better integrated into the policy conversation. Um, you know, we've done a really good job in New York with Local Law 97. There are the resilience design guidelines, which are now kind of going to be sort of required for city property. But I think we need to be really thinking from a policy level, not to overburden the builders, but really to think intelligently about the problem both from like a land use and zoning perspective, um, you know, the standards perspective, how do we fund these? But it, I think that's who also needs to be at the table in this conversation. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good point. And so the, the, the law she's talking about there is local law uh, 41, I believe that requires all New York city capital infrastructure projects to go through climate resiliency design guidelines. And I think that's rolling out in 20, they're doing pilots right now, but 2026 Correct. is when it will, effectively roll out. So maybe we can also put a link to that in the chat because that's a good example. And then of course, I should make a shameless plug here for Waterfront Alliance. You know, we house a waterfront edge design guidelines rating system that helps to verify projects along, you know, shorelines and, and coastlines around the country um, to be resilient, to be ecologically driven and to, into, to integrate community responsiveness and public access to the waterfront. And so there are these tools that you're talking about, but I, I absolutely agree that policy is 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 really key part of all of this, and that's something that we're definitely working on, especially around the workforce and the financing of all these issues. Anushi, I saw you were coming off mute, so if there's anything you want to add there too, yeah, just a couple of things. I think uh, to echo what uh, what you what you both just said about policy, I think it's important to think about that because ultimately the role of policy is to articulate what what counts as public value into setting a standard or like creating a law about that so that we can hold ourselves accountable. Um, and I think that, you know, part of that is acknowledging that what the status quo is today is not good enough, that we need to be doing better. And then, and then moving on from there, like what we've done is great, but we, there's a lot more that we could do. Um, and so a lot of our work has been around, you know, working with the Dice Resilience Coalition and others to develop community informed uh, metrics. Uh, to set standards for for us to you know work off to create a framework for these kind of policies and so just thinking about that um, and then the other thing I just wanted to say is that um, a lot of this policy work sometimes is thought of as like very high level and you know like 
a bunch of people just coming together and talking about this stuff. And I think something that's, that I've heard through the Climate Week these past few days is talking about collaboration and stakeholders coming together. And that's, that's not just community and that, that's not just the government. That's all sorts of people that are involved in this work and working together to create trust so that there's information that's shared and there's trust, trust that's built between these different people. Um, and I think I just want to say one one quote that someone said in a in the climate justice panel yesterday is that we all need to be in, otherwise we can't achieve a better future. And I think that 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 part about we all need to be in, I think is really important to remember that you know we've got to move together and break the barriers of trust and whatever whatever we have and just work together and get it done. Thanks, Anushi. That's really that I I'm not even nobody else. That's it. We're not we're not going anybody else after that. We're gonna move into audience questions because that's a great way to wrap up the the panel. So thank you so much for that. And and I'll move ahead now into the audience the audience Q and A. And I'll pull a couple questions here that I think we can that we can start with. So the first one somebody's asking, you know, what should the GSEs or Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac be doing to support climate ready housing. Um, I wonder if anybody has any thoughts here and maybe maybe whoever takes that can can say quickly what Fran Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are too. So I see Max and Rod are off mute. So fight it out. Rod, send it. Uh, well, you and I, uh, all of us own a piece of Fannie and Freddie because it's a uh, public private uh, institutions. And um, I can tell you that the both were there at the treasury meeting I attended in May of 2018. And my question to Fannie next to me was, well, how many of these high flood risk buildings do you have in your portfolio? We don't know. Uh, uh, the key is to get a handle on what we have. Anytime you're dealing with anything, it's a vulnerability assessment, it's a analysis, uh, and then figure out how to fix it. Uh, we know how to fix it. Uh, I do want to add one thing to our previous conversation, though, that I didn't get in earlier. Our, our uh, We've got to preserve these structures. So if we are involved with buyouts and relocation, which will become more and more frequent as the ocean continues to rise into these vulnerable areas, we should relocate those structures that we can that are in good enough condition and reuse them. Uh, every thousand square feet of wood frame house is 200 trees. It's not, it makes no sense to throw all of that into the dump. So I think that, I think Fannie and Freddie are key to the conversations. I think that there's a lot of conversations going on behind the scenes that we're not privy to. Uh, we just need to show everybody that we're prepared and we've, we're creating yeah. financing and a workforce to get this done because this is, this is a big human adaptation deal coming. Yeah. Max, Ilana, really quickly on this one too. I saw Ilana, you raise your hand. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, the short answer is that I'll put Annie and Freddie in the category of just lenders, right? They're public lenders, but there's lots of private lenders. Lenders should accept broader structures of insurance as satisfying, obtain and maintain requirements and make it easier to basically satisfy re requirements. Basically, they should lower their standards um, or change their standards, let's say. Um, there's risk there, but, you know, the, al the, alter the alternatives are all unpleasant and expensive. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question also about something that didn't, that didn't come up enough that, that is important to all of this. And so someone's asking, what are some of the nature-based solutions that we can look at to protect our housing communities and cities from increasing climate events? Which is a really, really good question. So I wonder if anybody wants to respond to that. I can uh, start. I mean, I think at the building scale, um, obviously there's the community scale, right? So there's Obviously, coastal flood protection. There's also, you know, what can cities do um, to nature-based solutions are much less expensive than expanding, you know, um, gray infrastructure, right? If you're if you're changing the pipes uh, under your streets, it's it's a huge investment that might not happen right away. Um, I think there's kind of this public-private partnership here where there could be, you know, I know New York City Department of Environmental Protection is undertaking a lot of effort to, you know, basically look at sidewalks and streets and areas where they can put in rain gardens or nature, you know, um, other types of, you know, more, more infiltration, uh, porous pavements, etc. But I think at the building scale there's certainly, you know, targeted efforts to reduce stormwater that you can undertake, you know, on your own property, um, including your roof, um, and also opportunities to you know, retain water on site and reuse it. Again, there are costs and regulatory aspects to all of this, but I think there's the property scale, but I think the challenge is also like, well, how do you 
develop something. Um, it's sort of a combination of the individual property owners and um, you know uh, the municipality as well. So I know Washington D.C. has a lot of um, you know kind of requirements around on-site uh, green infrastructure to help manage their stormwater, and that's built into the development process. Um, so there are models for that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that answer. And I mean, I, I'll just piggyback off of it and say that, yes, there's there's lots of natural nature-based solutions. And one, that's one area of policy that Waterfront Alliance and many of our partners in the Rise to Resilience Coalition, including Environmental Defense Fund, Riverkeeper, and many's are, many others are working on in terms of financing, actually, some of those solutions or incentive, creating incentives for those nature-based solutions. So, you know, there's a well, there's a a green roof tax abatement, for example, that exists for New York, um, where you can get a tax abatement on your roof if you make it green. And there's you know requirements. And the, this year there was a um, a reinstatement of that of that law, and it actually made it a little bit easier. They they kind of found some of the challenges with in, in installing green roofs on some of the buildings in New York, and they they lowered some of the requirements, including the soil depth and all that kind of stuff, to help make it easier for. Um, landlords and property owners to actually put uh, green infrastructure on the roof. And then to the point about the public right of way, I mean, there's a lot that can happen in terms of the city investing resources in rain gardens like Ilana was talking about. And one thing we're trying to do is figure out how to actually create incentives that act or or costs onto places that are impervious and, and are contributing to stormwater runoff. And how can we actually then, um, you know, create discounts for properties who are, you know, putting in green infrastructure or nature-based solutions or alleviating the flood risk essentially from their property. And so these are really important things. And, and that, I would actually say that, that that falls into the category of retrofits. I think if you're retrofitting your, your, your streetscape or your building, then um, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's absolutely a positive thing. Uh, okay, so we have just two minutes here. And one quick question maybe, Rod, if you can answer this. Um, are you able to share more about the source for the $3 million, $3 trillion, excuse me, figure? Um, yeah, that would be, that would be helpful. Yeah, I, I put that in the chat. Uh, if you just Google Congressional Budget Office or CBO Flood Adaptation Report, uh, it'll give you that report, uh, which was jaw-dropping and sobering for us because we, we used to talk about three or four million buildings to adapt, three million residential and a million commercial or non-residential. And, and now we're at 10.5 million just residential. So that could be three, three and a half million non-residential structures. It's usually three or four to one on residential to non-residential structures. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I think that was one of the first links that was shared in the chat was the yeah, I think CB, I, I posted CBO that on the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, great. Well, we have one minute. Um, there's a couple of other really good questions here, but I don't think we're going to have time to answer them. So instead I will just say, Thank you all to thank you so much to our panelists for joining and for all of your really, really great remarks. Um, it's it's a big issue and there's no way to slice it and dice it in one hour, but we did our best. And so thank you so much for 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 coming. Thank you to the audience for asking great questions, for taking time to be here and to think about these issues and, um, you know, a lot more to come on all of this. And so uh, definitely stay stay tuned. Check out some of the other work that Waterfront Alliance is doing and and, of course, the great work of our panelists. So thanks again, everybody, for your time and have a great rest of your climate week.